Hello and welcome everyone to our next session, Stars of COVID Response, Business Success Stories from COVID-19. My name is Sheila Casserly and I lead outreach and membership at the Business Call to Action. This means that I have the pleasure of learning about innovative, uh, impactful, inclusive business models, but the even greater pleasure of getting to know the trailblazing and, and visionary leaders behind them. And trailblazing and visionary business leaders is exactly what we have for you in this session. So as we all already know, this global pandemic has taken a pretty exhausting and destructive toll on communities and businesses across the world. But it has also saved, uh, or excuse me, paved the way for business innovation and new ways of operating and new ways of serving those who are most vulnerable. Each speaker here in this very exciting session will take the live virtual stage for five or so minutes to present their business models and to demonstrate how they have tapped into their experience and ingenuity and compassion to effectively respond to this pandemic and make sure they're still serving the lives and livelihoods of their stakeholders around the world. If we have a few minutes left at the end of this session, we'll take some questions from the audience for our speakers. Uh, so you can please feel free to write your questions here in this virtual event space. Um, and even if we don't get time for them at the end, uh, we'll make sure that they get to the speakers after the session and they'll still be excellent conversation starters after the session. So before we begin this series of presentations and get to the speakers themselves, I just want to share a short personal reflection. Uh, during these last weeks of event preparation, which have, uh, yes, been time consuming uh, to say the least, a very clear and resounding highlight has been speaking with all of these speakers in preparation for this session and being reminded of how incredible the businesses and business leaders in our network are. Uh, Greg, our first speaker, dialed in to our prep call uh, from the top of a mountain in Vietnam. Uh, Muthifi, who we'll hear from, uh, was in the middle of a bumpy car ride in a forest road in Kenya. Sujata, during our call, uh, marveled how she ever did anything except for what she's doing right now, empowering the lives of women in India and Nepal. Hans Peter in Germany, we battled with internet connectivity. And Jonathan, you and your team have made yourselves available at unspeakable hours to share your impactful work. I think the sun is just rising where you are right now. So all I can really do in introducing this session is commend you for your dedication, which speaks very loudly for itself. Uh, I will leave the stories of your business and your exemplary pandemic responses to all of you. So let's get started. I will pass it over to Greg Dyer, the CEO and co-founder of the Medical Technology Transfer and Services, or MTTS, from Vietnam. Over to you, Greg. Okay, I think I can start now. Thank you very much for um, joining me. And I would like to share with you today the story of uh, the Impala ventilator. This is the... Um, it was important to start with a little bit of background to understand where we came from, I think, to, to share entire story of the ventilator. So medical technology transfer and services it's a social enterprise that was established in 2004 to address complete lack of appropriate medical equipment in Vietnam. We knew that uh, there's a lot of simple, uh, cheap and well-established technologies out there, but with a little bit of effort, we could help saving millions of lives, not only of those who can afford it, but also those who cannot. Most of our medical equipment we saw in Vietnam at the time was too expensive not only to buy, but also to keep it running. The users didn't know how to operate it because it was too complex. And very often it stayed somewhere in the closet because the service parts were not available. 
We changed that with setting up local manufacturing and we started with the devices for neonatal intensive care. Over the last 16 years, we developed the technologies that address most of the health issues of neonates. Our project reached out from Vietnam to other countries in Southeast Asia, and also Africa and recently even South America. Then the COVID crisis came and our team started to think, is there anything we can do to help? Naturally, our first thoughts were around the ventilators, which we know very well and were a very hot topic at the time. I'm sure you heard the stories about all the devices being developed by everybody, from student groups to car makers. We ask ourselves, is there a really need for one more model? Uh, having analyzed all the data, we decided to go for it, and that's how Impala idea started. It turned out that the technology itself is not the biggest problem, especially for the company with, that has this level of expertise. The real challenge was with the making sure that the, the device, uh, we can make the device of consistent quality, it is affordable, and we can make it at scale. Our prototype was ready in just a month time, and then we start to have issues with sourcing the components. The components were in short supply because of the huge demand and broken supply chains. Even today, some of the components are still scarce, but it seems like the situation is getting better. Our devices are certified by external laboratories, so we went through the same with Impala. The process also takes time, but we managed to do it quickly because uh, we have uh, certain certifications for facilities and assembly processes in place. The Impala ventilator design is based on exactly the same principles that we were with us when we worked on our first devices in 2004. Most importantly, it's affordable. The price is less than half of what you needs, needs to be spent on the comparable devices. We eliminated all disposable parts that were possible to eliminate replacing them by the reusable ones. It not only drives the cost of the device down, but also makes the clinicians less dependent on deliveries. And they also tend to be unreliable these days. We spend most of our development time on complex software algorithms to make sure that the user interface is as simple as possible. The clinicians, the clinical parameters, uh, such as maximum flow, pressure, and volume were consulted with local clinicians and WHO experts which makes Impala suitable for patients with wide range of clinical conditions. For the locations where electricity is not always available, we added the battery backup. This allows us to run the device without electricity for at least four hours. We also included onboard air compressor to save the costs of medical air that can be expensive and sometimes it's not available. As a result, the Impala ventilator is the appropriate medical device made for those who need it the most. We are able to deliver it even to the most lo remote locations using our existing distribution network. We hope that we, you can share this information with those who, can, who need respiratory support devices and still struggle with their choices. We make sure that they receive the world-class device with all the service and support required to give them a chance to save as many lives as possible. Thank you. Perfect. Greg, thank you so much for sharing about MTTS. And uh, as you all know, we are uh, in this new virtual world with a virtual event and uh, we're, we're going with the flow as our uh, screen sharing and, and audio video uh, gets fine tuned here in, in our call. So thank you to all our speakers and our audience out there for uh, your patience and flexibility and, and understanding. Uh, I am now very pleased to move to our next speaker, Ms. Sujata Ramani, calling in from Bangalore, India, who is the CEO of Pollinate Group. So Sujata, please let us know about your business and your exemplary pandemic response. Thank you so much, Sheila. It's, it's absolutely a privilege and an honor to be speaking here. 
And thanks for providing this platform for uh, Pollinate to share uh, the COVID response stories. Um, a brief introduction about our company. Uh, Pollinate Group is a company that's dedicated to empowering women from the most marginalized communities in India and Nepal. We identify women with potential in these communities that you see in the picture on the top left screen and provide them with entrepreneurship intervention. And the products that are used to provide entrepreneurship intervention are the clean energy products that are absolutely um, important in improving their living conditions. As you can see in the picture, they have no access to anything on the grid, uh, such as electricity or water or sanitation. And the products that we sell of clean energy are the solar light, solar fans, and solar cookers, which are life improving. And these products are sold by our women entrepreneurs into these communities, which means the improvement in the living conditions is impacted through the communities that these women sell these products into. While they do all of that, uh, what they gain is a very dignified source of income, which helps them pull them out of poverty. Uh, that's the sum and substance of what uh, Pollinate does. And the map shows the locations that we are present in. We are present in six locations in India, three in South, two in North and one in East. And we are present in two locations in Nepal. Um, from the description, it's very evident that all our engagements are extremely field intensive. So uh, when COVID happened uh, in mid-February, when the first case was identified in India, we realized how vulnerable our communities are. Uh, the kind of proximity that you see of these uh, tents that are pitched so close to each other signifies the kind of vulnerability of the scare of some such virus growing very rapidly into all of these communities. As part of our intervention, we immediately included health and hygiene training uh, interventions for them, which included training on importance of washing hands, wearing masks, health hygiene, and social distancing. Um, one of the most important uh, you know, outcomes of this is that up until August, we did not have a single case in over 100 communities that we are servicing uh, through the pandemic. In August was when the first incident of a COVID patient came up, and it was also isolated to a person who moved into that community from a, a place somewhere else, and it was identified, and that person was isolated, and the rest of the community was safe. Um, Two important incidences that I want to share of how our women um, who learned about the importance of health and hygiene displayed that in our uh, two countries is the one instance in Nepal was when a person traveled from abroad and came in and was about to join the family. Our woman entrepreneur uh, was observing this and she went up to the family and said, I think you should quarantine this person for two weeks. He might be uh, carrying this infection and it's not wise for him to immediately mingle with the family. The family was aware of certain protocols and when the lady explained it to her, they saw merit in it and they quarantined this person and they were very thankful to our women entrepreneur who gave them that advisory. The second incident happened in Kanpur when there were uh, a local NGO partners that went into these communities to give them free groceries along with the TV crew. Our women entrepreneur observed that they were all standing very close to each other and are not maintaining social distance. She immediately went up to them and said, I will not allow you to come close to our community until you are all standing far apart. And she also ensured that she brought the members from the community all standing in a line three, four feet apart. These incidences are extremely gratifying for us to say that the timely intervention of health and hygiene that was provided to our women entrepreneurs helped keep our communities safe from this pandemic. While these are examples of how our women entrepreneurs showed leadership, Pollinate had a lot to learn as well. Um, as you would have understood by now, our field engagements are very intense. Our training staff meet with them continuously to provide them with the training content. And our uh, field staff provide them with a lot of products which are required to be distributed in these, in these communities by these women. Uh, we have internally taken two important decisions to include low-touch business model uh, adaptation. We've con creating content of training on a learning management platform, which will help us in two ways. It will help us scale. It will help the Surya Muki have access to the content anytime and any number of times that she wants to learn and pick up knowledge about the product and about the process. 
The second is about the distribution where our staff was carrying this product and giving it to our uh, women entrepreneurs. We've identified distribution partners who follow protocols of safe distancing and uh, safe handling of products and carry these products to our uh, women entrepreneurs in the community. These two new business processes is going to set pollinate for growth and scale in the future. That is going to be very, very helpful for us to create massive impact with many more communities in the future. Right in the middle of the pandemic, uh, the chart that you see in front of you uh, is, is what we did by keeping continuous engagement with our minimum entrepreneurs and understand what was required at that moment. And we pivoted by including essentials and immediate health and hygiene need products that were made available to our women entrepreneurs and distributed. Some were distributed freely because we associated ourselves with many other like-minded NGO partners. And we also made sure that many other products were given in subsidized price for them to help uh, take this to the right audience. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to be a, a part of this session and sharing our experience. Perfect. And we certainly thank you, Sujata, for being here as well. So we've heard from Greg at MTTS and Sujata at Pollinate Group, both who have had a fantastic response in, in particular uh, as it relates to women's empowerment and, and protecting the, the lives of women. And, uh, and I, I'm happy now to, to move over to Germany, where we have our next speaker uh, joining on kind of playing two roles. So Hans-Peter Teufos is the Director of International Programs at the UPS Foundation, but he is also here on behalf of a sister business network here at the UN called the Connecting Business Initiative, um, of which UPS Foundation is, uh, has been supporting. So Hans-Peter Teufos, uh, over to you. Thank you, Sheila. Let me share my screen, first of all, hoping that this works out. <clears throat> Here we go. So dear business leaders and um, professionals, fellow speakers, I have the pleasure to represent a range of private sector pandemic response stores in this session today, as I'm speaking um, not only on behalf of the UPS Foundation, but as well um, on behalf of the Connecting Business Initiative, which the UPS Foundation uh, has co-founded in 2016 at the World Humanitarian Summit. The world looked quite different in 2016, yet there were already many hazards, natural man-made, health-related, that the private sector was well suited to prepare for, to respond and to recover from. Envisioned in partnership between the UN Development Program and the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or short UNOCHA, CBI was established to create proactive private sector networks that preempted hazards so that when the disaster of any kind inevitably struck time would not be lost scrambling to figure out what to do, who to call, or how to respond. The rationale was simple. Disasters are bad for business, and they wipe out hard-worn development gains. Even pre-COVID-19 figures showed that on top of already devastating immediate shocks and consequences, disasters push an estimate 26 million people into property every day, poverty every day every year, sorry. It is now estimated that COVID-19 could push over 71 million people into extreme poverty in 2020. What long-term effect this will have remains to be seen, but what is known is that disasters, whether health-related, man-made or natural, will continue to disrupt both business and development going forward. Now, in 2019, in coordination with governments, NGOs, local communities, and the UN, private sector networks supported by CBI responded to 31 different disasters around the world, ranging from floods and earthquakes to measles outbreaks and a terrorist attack. These private sector networks have been able to quickly mobilize and respond to COVID-19 using established coordination structures and the capacity um, they have built over the last years to provide philanthropic and core business support to respond to this crisis. CBI networks have 
responded to COVID in a number of ways. Let me show you a little bit um, so that you get an overview on <clears throat> the groups. So they have conducted social, social uh, economic impact surveys, especially looking at the most vulnerable micro, small and medium sized enterprises and identified important takeaways. For example, that in Turkey, Syrian owned enterprises have been more heavily impacted by the pandemic. The CBI network in the Philippines set up an online COVID-19 recovery hub that provides knowledge on how to adapt and redesign business operations and shares available funding opportunities. The network in the Philippines has also mobilized about $100 million for COVID-19 response, 36 million of which went to providing cash vouchers to 40.2 million urban poor. CBI business networks have leveraged their wide reach to fight the infodemic as well and organized information sharing and awareness rising campaigns such as in Haiti. CBI business networks also supported the local private sector to repurpose their business operations to com contribute to crisis response as in Sri Lanka where companies pivoted to producing personal protecting um, in uh, equipment and medical devices um, with support from the CBI network in terms of facilitating access to capital and buyers. Many networks have engaged in policy dialogue with their governments and made evidence-based policy recommendations for both response and recovery. Let me just briefly strive and head over to UPS and what we did. Um, I'm happy to highlight a few things that we have done here, uh, following a strategy uh, that you see lined up in the, in the slide. Now, since the start of COVID-19, uh, we committed over 21 million in funding in in-kind and in technical support for global and local efforts in the fight against and recovery from COVID-19. This investment will secure much needed support for stakeholders in healthcare and PPEs, food security, education, and financial and economic sustainability. Through, its, through the core business, UPS has provided more than 100 in-kind shipments of critical PPE or educational and food supplies to food pantries, first responders, hospitals, senior living facilities, homeless shelters, and homebound students. This includes countries like Italy, UK with direct aid, but as well countries like Turkey, uh, and as well Asian countries like Vietnam and the Philippines, where we transported raw materials to facilitate an in-country PPE production. UPS is also innovating using our drones experience from UPS Flight Forward, first drone airline ever, to help COVID-19 response and support delivering medicine. Of course, we prepare for the critical supply chains coming up with vaccines available hopefully soon. We already increase ultra cold storage in freezer farms and work in collaboration with manufacturers and many agencies. To conclude, I would like to encourage everyone to take advantage of this momentum for deeper collaboration between diverse actors and advocate for more partners to join collective action platforms like BCTA and CBI in order to protect, protect the most vulnerable and together build forward better for, from COVID-19. In addition, let us all learn from this global experience and better prepare for future hazards. As Benjamin Franklin famously advised fire-prone Philadelphians in 1736, the once of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Thanks a lot for listening. Right. Thank you so much, Hans Peter from UPS Foundation, and, and again, also representing the Connecting Business Initiative, a fellow business network here at the UN. And uh, I think also from the part of Business Call to Action, uh, we can echo your call to other organizations to get involved in these kinds of active partnerships uh, so that we can come together and, and have more solutions like the one that all the speakers here are presenting today. So uh, moving to our next star of COVID response, I'm happy to present Muthithi Kinyanjui, who is calling in from Kenya. She is business development manager at Acre Africa, and I will pass it to her to tell us more about 
Acre Africa and what they have done in response to COVID. Thank you, Musiti. Thank you, Sheila, for this opportunity to present Acre's COVID response. Um, allow me to share my screen. Great. Um, so uh, the Agriculture and Climate Risk Enterprise Limited um, is a company uh, that is commonly referred to by its acronym, Acre Africa. It's an insurance intermediary um, that designs agriculture insurance products for farmers in Africa. Acre Africa operates as an insurance service provider, um, an organization that's not an insurance company, but rather working with local insurance and other stakeholders in the agricultural insurance value chain. Acre Africa is registered as an insurance surveyor in Kenya, as an agent in Rwanda and Tanzania, with headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. Implementation in other countries in Africa is normally done on a project by project basis, using partners in country for support. So Eka Africa utilizes the integrated risk management model and undertakes risk management um, through assessments, product development, and customer education and risk monitoring to facilitate access to insurance products for smallholder farmers. With tailored microinsurance products, farmers can confidently invest in quality inputs, increase their productivity, and access agricultural loans. Based on the expertise developed within the team, ACA Africa also offers advisory and consultancy services to help organizations understand um, and enter local microinsurance markets in Africa with a clear and informed strategy. So these are some of um, our insurance products and advisory services that we offer. So this is how we reach our farmers. We utilize a high touch, what we call in-person contact and low touch, uh, which is largely digital approaches to reach our farmers. In particular, to effectively distribute and deploy our products to smallholder farmers, we apply a hybridized approach uh, in order to create the trust factor essential to sell um, insurance in African communities. Our business model is heavily reliant on partnerships for market reach and product development as we largely utilize a bundled approach to solution packaging. This is caused by the low demand for agriculture insurance um, due to a variety of factors such as low trust among um, uh, the communities and also a low understanding of the subject matter. On the diagram, we have the two models that we primarily utilize to reach farmers, which is either through aggregators or the village-based champions, a peer-to-peer -peer network of trusted farmers in their communities. Um, and this model was set up and the operations were funded by Agra. Through these channels, we are able to develop products that are relevant to the value chains and farmers and that are suited for the specific agroecological zones of the specific locations that the farmers are in. So innovations are important uh, for Acre Africa, and these are some of them. Um, our key innovations are usually around products because we want to develop products that are affordable, that are accessible to rural smallholder farmers in African communities. We would also like to improve the value proposition so that there's an increased uh, trust factor and an improved perception of agriculture insurance, thereby leading to um, an increased demand for the products. Um, we utilize participatory approaches and we work very closely with our partners and farmers on the ground in order to develop these products. So these are just examples of some of the products that we have deployed um, among our farming communities. So for us, um, the, we had ambitious targets uh, this year we planned to reach 150,000 smallholder farmers with insurance solutions in 2020, but these were pan, uh, hampered by the pandemic. Um, so what we did instead of having the commoditized card, which is this uh, Bima Pima uh, card that is a scratch card, we had to um, utilize a, a USSD platform. So we supported the farmers to onboard onto our insurance products using a call center that had multilingual um, agents that would walk the farmers through the onboarding process. 
So we, we access these farmers through um, a database of uh, pro, uh, profiled farmers that we got from local governments and also from our own past uh, um, clients. And we walked them through the onboarding and we, were su we successfully onboarded 34,000 uh, smallholder farmers spread across Kenya, 56% of whom uh, were women. So we had mapped out our village champions and we also provided their numbers as the support, uh, local support for the farmers to call in case they had any issues. Um, so we were very uh, well supported by the Kenyan government through the counties and uh, we, could, uh, we, could document, we could document success uh, as a result of these uh, partnerships. Um, these are some of our key partners. Um, and uh, thanks for listening. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Muthiti, calling from Kenya at, at Acre Africa. And uh, thank you also for just reminding us the importance these days of staying close to the communities that we work with and work in. And uh, I think that's another kind of common link between all of the speakers in this session today is just how they have really put their stakeholders first um, as they innovate and transition uh, and cope with pandemic response. Uh, and speaking of transitioning to uh, the demands of, of COVID response, I am very happy to present last but certainly not, not least, uh, Jonathan Jackson, the CEO and co-founder of Demagi, dialing in bright and early. Uh, and he will present to us the uh, exemplary response of Demagi, and I'm very excited for everyone to hear it. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm very excited to present the work that Demagi has undertaken for COVID-19 response. Uh, to give a quick background on us, we have actually been a social enterprise since 2002, which has enabled us to see over 2,000 projects across 130 countries. So we like to think that we have about as much experience deploying technology at the front lines in global health as anybody. That's led us to develop our technology platform called ComCare, which is now the world's most powerful data collection and service delivery platform. We have over 400 million people registered in the system, 700,000 active users, and roughly one in 50 births is captured in the platform in real time. So we're very excited by the scale that Comcare had achieved prior to COVID, and we were able to leverage a lot of this going forward. One of the reasons I think our COVID-19 response was so effective is our prior experience dealing with global health pandemics. Um, back when we had the Ebola outbreak in 2014, 2015, and then again, 2018, uh, Demagi was uh, partnered with organizations on the ground in West Africa who were responding to Ebola response. That experience taught us a lot about how technology can be effective, how hard it is to deploy technology in times of pandemic. It is much harder than just building the software. The human concerns, working with the government, making sure regulatory factors are taken into consideration are all things that are very important when looking to deploy this type of technology. But building from that experience early in February and March, we pulled together a team within the organization, moving about 20% of our staff onto our COVID response team, uh, specifically to build out template applications that we knew were going to be useful all across the world. Um, the primary application that we had done with Ebola and was the, the starting point for what we built out was contact tracing. Um, so we knew that there was going to be a big challenge on how to support contact tracing, particularly in low resource settings where you need offline capabilities, which our platform supports but also things like port of entry screening, facility readiness and stock tracking, health worker training and monitoring, and then lab and sample tracking. So we built out these template applications rapidly with our partners. And again, because of our prior work with Ebola, our prior work in the pandemic, and our knowledge of our huge network in over 80 countries of local implementing organizations, we were able to not just build these with our technical expertise, but with rapid feedback from our partners remotely. Typically, we like to be on the ground doing user-centered design as we build applications like these. That was completely unfeasible during COVID, but we got incredibly strong responses from our partners helping advise how to design, build, and get feedback on these rapidly. We then made these applications freely available for COVID. Another thing that gets in the way of deploying technology is funding challenges. We knew there would be an initial push of funding like we saw with Ebola, but we also knew that would be not nearly enough. So we tried to make uh, come here as accessible as we could to the entire global community. Interestingly, something that happened was part of the global community turned out to be the United States this time. 
We are based and headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts, um, but we typically do most of our work overseas in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Here, we got contacted to ask if we could help with the COVID-19 local response system targeted at the US context. So rather than leveraging the mobile application alone, we were also leveraging our web application and then bi-directional messaging to uh, contacts or cases that may be under quarantine or need support. So this was a comprehensive approach to COVID case investigation and following up with COVID contact tracing. And again, as I said, prior to this traction, we had already moved 20% of the company into our COVID response team. And then things uh, really started to accelerate for Damagi. And again, our experience in global health, I think really positioned us well to help support the United States in their public health response. So starting back in March, we'd released the templates that I had talked about. And early on, San Francisco and Santa Clara, which are two counties in California, got in touch to see if we could support their uh, contact tracing response efforts. And we successfully put boots on the ground with those teams to deploy ComCare learned a lot about how this is not just about the data collection from an epidemiological standpoint, but holistic support of the individual, whether they have food insecurity, housing insecurity, many of the issues we deal with in global health were also highly relevant here. And that success in San Francisco and Santa Clara then led to a lot of discussions with other states. And we then added Navajo Nation, New York State, Alaska, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Colorado. Um, and again, this was new territory for Demagi to a large extent. We've done a lot of work in the US previously with underserved populations, but not really working at the state or federal level. And we've been incredibly excited that so many of the lessons we've learned in global health about how to successfully partner, how to do user-centered design, and how to make sure we're supporting the local communities translated incredibly well to this public health crisis in the US and we were able to support in our local areas as well. That's led to a very large footprint that Damagi is now supporting uh, for COVID-19 response. Um, as you can see, many different countries that we're supporting in different capacities across our application. But most importantly, and one of the things we're most proud of is supporting our core business. Our, our work prior to COVID-19 worked with many large and small NGOs doing a wide variety of public health services, uh, agriculture services, financial services, keeping those programs running, whether it was virtual or in-person, is just as critical to make sure we stem the tide of the horrific response um, to those most vulnerable due to COVID-19. And so responding with ComCare as a digital platform was critical, but also maintaining our existing programs and making sure that we were able to be responsive to the needs of our clients as they had to shift their programs as well. And so we're incredibly proud and fortunate to have been part of a great network that was able to leverage this technology and try to make as much of an impact as we could on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and uh, thanks so much for sharing about the, the background that, that led to not only the, the impact that you're having in, uh, in the countries around the world that uh, Demagi is working in, but also that you know, led back home in a way to, uh, to also uh, bring an effective response to the United States. Um, and, and also just looking at the, the maps here that we've seen in these presentations, it, it reminds me, I, I want to call everyone's attention in the audience to the fact that um, you can look through these presentations and uh, yes, you go back and, and review um, the, the huge impact and the, the pandemic responses that uh, the speakers here have, have presented. Um, these materials are available in the area that you're watching uh, in this in this live session. Um, so you should see the, the links where you can click on their resources if you are interested in learning more and, and following up and connecting with them. Uh, for these last moments of our uh, of our session here, I, I would like to ask all of the speakers to, uh, if possible, turn on your cameras uh, for a kind of open discussion. Um, it would be great to uh, see everybody's faces all at once. And I think for the technical team, this is possible as well. So hopefully uh, everyone can see us. Um, and I, I guess I would like to ask uh, if I may put people on the spot for a moment, but just you've, you've, you've told us about your, uh, your business models, um, how that experience operating inclusive business models has, uh, has led into a, a pandemic response. And I guess I want, I want to ask if you can define in, in just um, a word or I guess three words maximum, we can say the secret ingredients that you've identified in 
responding to this crisis. Uh, so if, if anyone, if there's any brave volunteers um, to, to point out just a few of those keywords, the key ingredients of successfully pivoting and effectively responding uh, to this crisis, I would, I would ask you to raise your hand and unmute yourself. Hans Peter, go ahead. Okay, very simple. I mean, what we are going to do here is uh, we have to build resilience, right? Because um, this crisis won't be going away that easy and that fast. So therefore, a sustainable solution and creating sustainable solution is of the essence. And um, uh, on one hand, it is relevant, and that's what we try to do, to build um, a supply chains that are sustainable and that incorporate uh, any factor that is needed, including information systems and so forth. So as well to build for the next one. So who says that COVID is the last one? And let me just uh, point out on one hand, there are two things that are really relevant in these times, and that is healthcare and nutrition, right? So therefore, I think if I'm looking into the ACRA model that Titi presented, for instance, I like that very much because I think that behavioral change in including insurance into their overall daily work extremely relevant because that's that's part of our world since years since decades i mean and um uh, especially in this case we are talking about nutrition for for very vulnerable groups of people that's very relevant thanks thanks very much hans peter uh Sujata. yeah yeah um, i would just call it out in two words the first is of course engagement um, our continuous engagement with the team um, helped us in a way to be able to enable them. So that's the second word that I would like to use. You know, we were able to understand the needs and enable them with quickly turning around and pivoting what, what was required and provide them with that. And all of this comes with the inherent ability of our team to be able to execute on all of those. So I think these are the three critical words that to be continuously engaged and to be able to enable them and execute on how we want to do that, which, which comes with a completely empowered team that we have. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Greg or Mutiti or Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, I'd say for us, um, new partnership models was critical. Partnerships have always been very necessary for our work, but being creative and rapid in developing new partnerships. Um, Medic Mobile, who is often viewed as one of our competitors um, in the space, we've had a great partnership with them through COVID um, with support from the Rockefeller Foundation. And that came together very quickly because we we all knew we had to figure out different ways of working together and more collaboratively, more effectively. Thank you so much. Uh, Mutiti, go ahead. Great. Um, our three secret ingredients were um, partnerships. Um, we certainly couldn't have been able to reach um, the rural farmers within this uh, sort of time frame without our strong partnerships on the ground. Um, we also would not have been able to do it without the digital infrastructure that we'd already set up um, to be able to access the farmers uh, directly and also uh, through, which is the third one, our participatory approach with the agents who are also farmers in those uh, communities themselves. Yeah. And Greg, how about from MTTS? Yes, yeah, internally, we really have to team up and make sure that our team is very efficient. So quick transition to what we normally do to put all the attention to the technology development and, and making sure it's quickly available. But most importantly, I and mean, more importantly, to access to, to the people who need it, making sure that nobody is left behind, that the patients get the technology that we're developing. And that, that was an enormous challenge. It was logistics was devastated over the last few months. And it was on both supply chain, also our delivery um, uh, transporters to the to the sub-Saharan Africa, especially. So it was really, really tough, but we figured out thanks to also local partners and they huge help. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I think these are all excellent notes to end our all too quick session on. And uh, just to kind of recap, I mean, it, the answers that you gave, resilience, engagement, the participatory approach, the importance of, of being so closely engaged, partnerships, partnerships everywhere, and also touching on digital infrastructure. Uh, this all gives me hope too, not only because you, you are all doing it so effectively, but these are definitely the themes that 
we have have brought here to our event today and that we're hoping everyone uh speakers and, and audience uh will will also contribute their their experience to um in the various sessions uh both panels and lounges that we have touching on all of these key words so um Thank you everybody so much for, for your time, the speakers today. I think I can say on behalf of everyone at this event, I've already uh, you know, praised your, your dedication, which was so clear to me in our preparations for this session. And uh, I just want to say you're not only stars of COVID response, but also the, the stars of this future, as Greg said, uh, where no one is left behind making sure that uh, we are all living in a more inclusive and resilient and innovative future. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, hope to see you all at the other sessions and lounges throughout the day. Thank you.